That completes Scottish questions. We now come to the Prime Minister, but I just want to announce to the House we are joined today by the President of the Chamber of Deputies of Parliament of the Czech Republic. Welcome. Yeah. We now come to Prime Minister's questions. Richard Thompson. Yeah, yeah. Number one, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, I know that members from across the House will want to join me in offering our best wishes to His Majesty the King and Her Royal Highness the Princess of Wales. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House this afternoon, I shall be meeting the extraordinary 100-year-old Holocaust survivor, Lily Ebert. Lily promised that if she survived Auschwitz, she would tell the world the truth of what happened. Never has such a promise been so profoundly fulfilled. And as we prepare to mark Holocaust Memorial Day on Saturday, I am sure the whole House will join me in reaffirming our promise to Lily that we will never forget the Holocaust and we will carry forward her life's work for generations to come. Richard Thompson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And can I echo the Prime Minister's comments on uh, World Holocaust Day? Yeah, yeah. Uh, let my constituents, like all of our constituents, rely on the Royal Mail to deliver important items of mail and yep. packages and for people to run their businesses. Mm. So they will be very alarmed to learn of proposals from Ofcom that Royal Mail might be allowed to cut the number of days that they might be able to that they will provide that service. Can the Prime Minister give a commitment to me here today that under his watch there will be no reduction in postal services provided by the Royal Mail in Scotland or anywhere else? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, Mr Speaker, I agree about the importance of the Royal Mail's universal service obligation, and as you will have heard from the Minister this morning, we remain absolutely committed to ensuring that it remains as it is. Paul Holmes. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Yeah. 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 The Lib Dem, Lib Dem run council in Eastleigh has just received a report from their external auditors warning of the possibility of fraud and ignoring whistleblowers who try to warn them. Does the Prime Minister agree with me that Lib Dem leaders who shun accountability, shun transparency and simply say, not me, Gov, should start showing some remorse and responsibility or make way for those who will? Yeah. Well, my... Uh... Only the answer. Come on, Prime. My, uh, my honourable friend raises an important matter to the people of Eastleigh, which I was pleased to discuss with him on my recent visit to his area, and I know that the contents of the report are deeply concerning. It is disappointing to see this Liberal Democrat run council rack up debt with absolutely no plan for how to fund it. And the council has been issued with a best value notice, and I know that he is talking to the Department of Leveling Up, who will be monitoring the situation closely. Yeah. We now come to the Leader of the Opposition, Keir Starmer. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I join the Prime Minister in his comments about His Majesty the King and Her Royal Highness the Princess of Wales, and in his comments about Holocaust Memorial Day? Never again must be said more defiantly this year, as it's said every year. Yeah. Uh, Mr Speaker, last week we lost Sir Tony Lloyd, a true public servant who touched the lives of many people across the House and across the country. And I'm glad that his family were here yesterday to hear the many tributes to and memories of Tony. He will be greatly missed. Yeah. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister's had quite a week, from endlessly fighting with his own MPs to collapsing in laughter when he was asked by a member of the public about NHS waiting lists. <laughs> So I was glad to hear that he managed to take some time off. Can, can I just say, I wanted to the Prime Minister, I'm certainly going to hear the Leader of the Opposition. Those people who don't want to hear, they can certainly leave, because that's who it's going to be, so get it in order. Some of you are wanting to catch my eye again. It's not a good way to do it. Yes. Mr Speaker, I, I love this quaint tradition where the more they slag him off behind his back, the later they cheer in here. <laughs> Keep it going. But I... And also, for this side, you can have a joint cup of tea. Come on. <laughs> Mr Speaker, I was glad to see that he managed to get some time off yesterday afternoon to kick back, relax and accidentally record a candid video for Nigel Farage. <laughs> The only thing missing from that punishing schedule is any sort of governing or leadership. So was he surprised to see one of his own MPs say that he doesn't get what Britain needs and he's not listening to what people want? Yeah. Prime Minister. Mr. S Mr Speaker, he talks about 
what Britain needs, what Britain wants, what Britain values. This from a man who takes the knee, Mr Speaker, who wanted to abolish the monarchy, who still doesn't know what a woman is, and just this week, and who just this week, one of his front benchers said that they backed teaching divisive white privilege in our schools, Mr Speaker. Looking at his record, it's crystal clear which one of us doesn't get Britain's values. Mr Switter. He spouts so much nonsense, no wonder they're giving up on him. <laughs> and, and, and even now, as his government crumbles around him and his own MPs point out he's out of touch, got no plan for growth, crime or building houses, the Prime Minister is sticking to his one-man Pollyanna show. Everything's fine. People should be grateful to him. The trouble is, no one's buying it. Does he actually understand why his own MPs say he doesn't understand Britain and that he is an obstacle to recovery? Five minutes. <laughs> Again, Mr Speaker, he, he calls it nonsense, but these are his positions, Mr Speaker. Right? And he doesn't want to talk about it, but this is the fact. He chose, he chose to represent a now prescribed terrorist group, Mr Speaker. He chose to campaign against the deportation of foreign national offenders, Mr Speaker, just like he chose to serve the Right Honourable Member for Islington North, Mr Speaker. That's his record, those are his values, and that is exactly how he should be judged. Mr Speaker, in 2008 I was the Director of Public Prosecution, putting terrorists and murderers in jail. He he was making millions betting on the misery of working people during the financial crisis. And we've seen this story time and time again with this lot. Party first, country second, safely ensconced in Westminster, they get down to the real business of fighting each other to death. The country forced to endure their division and chaos. The longest episode of EastEnders ever put to film. <laughs> Meanwhile, this week we discover that Britain is going to be the only major economy that no longer makes its own steel, that the government is handing out £500 million to make 3,000 steel workers redundant, and that the parents of thousands are being told that his free childcare promise is nothing but a mirage. Isn't he embarrassed that the Tory party is yet again entirely focused on itself? Mr Speaker, yet more sniping from the sidelines. Yeah, you can see, you can see, you can see, yeah, you can see exactly, you can see exactly why his but to rear hired him in the first place. But he wants to talk about these things. Even his own party are now realising that he simply doesn't have a plan for this country, Mr Speaker. The member for Dagenham and Rainham said it's difficult to identify the purpose of his leadership. And long-time and long-time celebrity backer Steve Coogan recently said he licks his finger, sticks it in the air, and just sees which way the wind is blowing. E even Labour Party know, Mr. Speaker, he's not a leader; he is a human weather vane. Yeah. It's not the sidelines; it's behind him that the fire's coming in, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> and he can try and blame the Labour Party all he wants. Yeah. The difference is. I've changed my party. He's bullied by his party. And has he found the time in his busy schedule to work out why thousands of parents are being told by their nurseries that they won't get free childcare that he promised them? Prime Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, let, let's see what his party is offering the country. It's great. Right. So, we all know, Mr. Speaker, he doesn't. He doesn't have many. He doesn't have many ideas for our country. Oh, oh, oh. I'm going to hear the prime minister. Uh, well, he, he, he doesn't have many. But one thing we do know, Mr. Speaker, is that you don't want to push it, do you? No. Do you know that he's committed to his 2030 decarbonisation promise, Mr. Speaker, which they say will cost 28 billion pounds? But I was reading about it this week. He says he's changed the party. One of his team called it an albatross hanging around their neck. That might have been the shadow chancellor, maybe, Mr. Speaker. But he said he said they're doubling down on it. 
All this ahead of a crunch meeting, we're told this week, for them to work out how they're going to pay for it. I can save them some time because we all know the answer. Higher taxes for the British people. Mr Speaker, there's only one party that crashed the economy. They're sitting right there. Oh, Mr Holmes, you've had your question already. Obviously, you don't want to remain for the rest of it. Here's some. Here's Mr 25 tax rises. And he's got nothing to say on childcare. Millions of families will have been listening for an answer, and they've got absolutely nothing. He announced that scheme a year ago, claiming it would get 60,000 parents back into work. Only on Monday of this week did he notice there were some, in his words, practical issues with that. <laughs> Eight weeks before its launch, parents can't budget, plan for work or make arrangements with their employers. And the Prime Minister's response is to say, it's all fine, it's the fault of the Labour Party. Is this merely a practical issue or is it yet another example of him simply not understanding how life works for other people? Yeah. Mr Speaker, we're delivering the biggest ever expansion of childcare in this country's history, Mr Speaker. But while millions of parents will benefit from that, again, it's right that he should come clean with them about the cost that his, that his plans will impose on all of them. He, he goes on and on about the green promise, Mr Speaker. He says he wants to keep it. He says he wants to keep it, but he doesn't have a plan to pay for it. What he's really saying is he'll scrap the borrowing associated but he wants to keep the £28 billion of spending. So, for all those working families who are benefiting from our free childcare, he should come clean with them now. Why doesn't he come clean with them now? Come clean with them now and just be clear, his plans mean back to square one and higher taxes for British people. Mr Speaker, making steelworkers redundant and failing to provide childcare is not a plan, Prime Minister. It's a farce. It's a farce. And he may soon discover that with childcare, there's an IT problem. Nurseries haven't got the spaces. They haven't got the staff. There's a black hole in their budget, and it's eight weeks to go. That isn't a plan. And families across the country, well, they can laugh all they like. Families are making plans now. They laugh at it. Of course they do. Families are struggling with a cost of living crisis, trying to work out the household budget, balancing spiralling mortgages, prices and eye-watering bills. And then at the last minute, they're thrown into chaos because their nursery says they can't deliver the free childcare he promised. Now, he calls that a practical issue. But I preferred the honesty of whichever of his colleagues briefed to the Times that it was, and I quote, a complete shit show. Who, who, who was it who briefed that to the Times? Hands up. Will the Prime Minister finally realise? I'll decide how long the question goes. Those who wish not to hear it, I've told you the answer, and I'll help you on the way. When will the Prime Minister finally realise that the biggest practical issue facing Britain is the constant farcical incompetence of the government that he leads? Yeah. Prime Minister, Mr Speaker, another week with no ideas, absolutely no ideas as country, and absolutely no plan. He talked about the cost of living, Mr Speaker, he talked about the economy, but he never actually brings it up, and we all know why, Mr Speaker, because things are improving and we are making progress. Wages now rising, Mr Speaker, debt on track to be reduced, and inflation more than half from 11% to 4%, because he actually knows that our plan is working and that his £28 billion tax grab will take Britain back to square one. And that, Mr Speaker, is the choice. It's back to square one and higher taxes with him, or a plan that's delivering a brighter future with the Conservatives. Change of gear, Mr Speaker. Too many oligarchs and kleptocrats are living off ill-gotten gains beyond the reach of domestic courts here or in countries like America. Ever since the 2016 London Anti-Corruption Summit, moves to create an international anti-corruption court have been gathering momentum to plug this gap. It already has support from countries like Canada, Holland and Nigeria and would fund itself from the fines it charged. Will this government take the lead in getting it underway, ending impunity for these crooks once and for all? Yeah. 
Well, can I firstly pay tribute to my honourable friend for his work on this issue? As I'm sure he'll appreciate, establishing a new bespoke institution is a significant endeavour, but I know he's discussed it with the Foreign Secretary, who will look at the proposals in more detail. And in the meantime, as he knows, our Economic Trim Act has a raft of new measures to crack down on dirty money, and we will shortly be publishing our second anti corruption strategy. We'll set out ambitious plans for combating corruption, both here at home but also internationally. SNP leader Stephen Flynn. Yeah. Mr Speaker, last night, as Tory MPs were once again fighting amongst themselves, the public were sat at home watching John Irvin of ITV News report on footage from Gaza of an unarmed Palestinian man walking under a white flag being shot and killed by the IDF. Prime Minister, such an act constitutes a war crime. Does it not? Yeah. 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 Mr Speaker, we have been absolutely consistent that international humanitarian law should be respected and civilians uh, will be, should be protected. I have made that point expressly to Prime Minister Netanyahu, and the Foreign Secretary is in the region this week making exactly the same point. Stephen Clay. Mr Speaker, I do not think it is unreasonable to expect the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom to rise to that dispatch box and tell the people of these isles and elsewhere that shooting an unarmed man walking under a white flag is a war crime. Now, now in recent weeks, this House has acted with urgency and intent following an ITV drama. The question is, will this House now show the same urgency and intent following this ITV news report, and finally back a ceasefire in Gaza. Mr Speaker, no one wants to see this conflict go on for a moment longer than necessary, and we do want to see an immediate and sustained humanitarian pause to get more aid in and, crucially, the hostages out, helping create the conditions for a sustainable ceasefire. I set out the conditions for that earlier in the House. The Foreign Secretary is in the region today, and we will continue to press all our allies and partners to make sure that we can bring about that outcome. Tom Hunt. Speaker, access to NHS dentistry is a key issue in Ipswich and Suffolk. Locally, actually, we've done something about it. The University of Suffolk and the local NHS deserve great credit for establishing a new dental centre which is going to carry 18,000 hours a year of NHS dental appointments. However, a source of great frustration for myself and a number of constituents is that many people who train to be a dentist at university for five years and have their training heavily subsidised can immediately go private or actually go abroad without giving anything back to the NHS. It seems wrong to me. Would the Prime Minister support with you of many of my constituents for, for, say, five years they work in the NHS, yeah. they give yeah, something yeah. back, and this make a huge contribution to this problem? Yeah. Prime Minister. Well, my, uh, my honourable friend is a long-standing campaigner for better dental access in his constituency, and I congratulate him on the new dental centre that's opening, which I know he worked very hard to deliver. And I agree with him. It's right and fair that we seek better value for the significant investment that the taxpayer makes in the education and training of the dental workforce. That's why, as our workforce plan outlined, we are exploring whether a tie-in would ensure that dentists spend a better proportion of their time in the NHS, and we'll be launching a consultation on this policy later this year. Mr. Speaker, in the week of the anniversary of Bloody Sunday, people in Derry are watching unarmed Palestinians being gunned down by Israeli soldiers. Over 25,000 people have now been slaughtered in Gaza. The Prime Minister says, and he said it again today, that he wants to see a sustained ceasefire. So my question is a very, very simple one. The next time there is a vote at the UN for a ceasefire, will his representative vote for it? Mr Speaker, of course we'll engage with all UN resolutions on their merits, and I've been clear no one wants to see this conflict go on for a moment longer than is necessary. We do want to see an immediate pause so we can get aid in and hostages out, because the situation is desperate for many people there. But a sustainable permanent ceasefire needs to fulfil a set of conditions, including Hamas releasing all of the hostages, Hamas no longer being in charge of Gaza with the threat of rocket attacks into Israel, and an agreement in place for the Palestinian Authority to return to Gaza to provide governance and services. The Foreign Secretary is in the region. Those are the principles on which we are working, and I believe those are shared by all our major allies. Sure. Yeah. In 1859, Brunel opened his rail bridge over the River Tamar. 
In 2022, I met with Network Rail and others to celebrate the agreement to build a simple footbridge going over the railway line in Los Withiel. That, that bridge still doesn't exist, and I have no completion date. Can my right honourable friend help? Hmm. Well, I know that my honourable friend is a long-standing campaigner for the footbridge at Los Withiel Station, and I recognise her concerns and the pressing need for the construction of this footbridge. Uh, I'm told that Network Rail is currently working on a funding solution for the, so that it can take forward this important project in the next financial year, and the Rail Minister will keep my honourable friend updated on his progress. Ms Twist. Thank you, Mr Speaker. A report released yesterday by the Joseph Roundtree Foundation found that one in four people in the North East are living in poverty, with the child poverty rate for every local authority in the region higher than the UK average. Too many of our people are being hard hit. Now, the Prime Minister says that his plan is beginning to work. So can I ask the Prime Minister, where does rising child poverty fit in his plan? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, well, in fact, uh, uh, Mr. Mr Speaker, the plan is working because poverty is falling in our country. Since 2010, there are 1.7 million fewer people in poverty, including hundreds of thousands of children. Of course, there is more to do. There is always more to do to make sure children do not grow up in poverty, but they absolutely would not be helped by Labour's £28 billion tax grab on their parents, which would take money out of their families' bank accounts. Jim Sunderland. Mr Speaker, Bracknell Forest is a place of aspiration, opportunity and enterprise. Yeah. Yeah. Business occupancy rates and employment figures are thankfully high. Footfall at the Lexicon Shopping Centre is up and wages are up, but the cost of living continues to bite across the UK. What more can be done to put more money in people's pockets? Oh, it is great to see, thanks to my honourable friend, that Bracknell Forest is thriving, with people in work up, footfall in the town centre up, and, as he knows, almost 100 per cent of his scores now good or outstanding. Uh, but he's right that we must do more to relieve the burden on working people, Mr Speaker, which is why we cut taxes for tens of millions of people in work earlier this year, worth on average £450. And we've got to stick to the plan for lower taxes, a strong economy and a brighter future for the people of Bracknell Forest, and absolutely not risk going back to square one with the Labour Party. Debbie Abraham. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Mr. Speaker, if everyone had the same good health as the least deprived 10% of the population, in England there would have been a million, a million fewer deaths between 2012 and 2019, and 28,000 fewer deaths in the first year of COVID. These inequalities are not inevitable. Does the Prime Minister think that cuts in Social Security to 85,000 low-income households, including people in low-paid work in my constituency, will help or, uh, to address these health inequalities? Well, I can assure the Honourable Lady that we are committed to caring for society's most vulnerable, and that's why almost 20 million families will see their benefit payments increase uh, this April, which will bring our total support over these few years to around £3,700 per UK household. Uh, the Department for Work and Pensions is looking very closely at how it can target its services precisely on the most vulnerable customers. And I know the Honourable Lady spoke to the DWP Permanent Secretary at length about this when he appeared before this select committee earlier this month, and I can assure her that he will be writing to the committee on exactly this subject shortly. Jonathan Lord. The post office scandal has affected so many people, including my constituent, Seema Misra, a sub postmaster from West Byfleet with an outstanding record of service to her community, who was wrongfully convicted in 2010 of stealing £75,000 and was sentenced to prison on her first son's birthday and whilst pregnant with her second son. Does the Prime Minister agree with me, and more importantly with Seema Misra herself, who is in the gallery today with her husband Davinda, that she is due a full apology from the Post Office, a full apology from Fujitsu, and proper compensation as a matter of urgency? And I know my honourable friend has been a great support to his constituents over all the years and has fought relentlessly 
for the truth to come out. As I've said, the Horizon scandal is one of the greatest miscarriages of justice in our nation's history. Uh, we will introduce, as I said a few weeks ago, primary legislation within weeks to ensure that all convictions that were based on erroneous Horizon evidence are quashed, that will clear people's names, deliver justice and ensure swifter access to compensation. Innocent people, like my honourable friends' constituents, have waited far too long and I'm determined that they receive compensation as swiftly as possible. We have a clear moral duty to right these wrongs and that is exactly what we will do. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In 2021, 3,527 food parcels were given out by Bullwell and Bestwood Food Bank. Last year, that number exploded to 6,500, with nearly half going to children. The food banks now having to buy food to supplement donations, which can only be sustained for a short period. Rather than pretending that things are getting better, will the Prime Minister apologise for the daily chaos in government, which is leading, leaving widespread destitution unaddressed? Yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, I don't want to see anyone rely on on food banks, but while, while, while they are in place, I have nothing but praise and thanks for the people who run them. But it is wrong to say that we are not making progress. When I take, came into this job, inflation was running at 11 per cent. That is the single biggest impact on families' cost of living. And now, thanks to the efforts of this Government, most of them opposed by his party, inflation has now been more than halved at 4 per cent, and we are combining that with significant tax cuts to put more money in people's bank accounts at the end of every month. That is the right way to go about supporting people, combined with our extensive cost of living support for the most vulnerable, and all the statistics show that that support has helped, has made a difference, and that is what you get with responsible management of the British economy. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. In November, I held an adjournment debate on the South Fylde Line and the need for a passing loop to double its hourly service and increase resilience against delays and cancellations, which again cause misery for travellers over Christmas. The assurances I received from the Rail Minister built on the positivity generated by the reallocation of HS2 funds. Since then, progress has been desperately slow, and my efforts to advance this critical piece of infrastructure for the people of Fylde has been frustrated. Will the Prime Minister meet with me to discuss how the Government can help to get the South Fylde line back on track? Prime Minister. My honourable friend is correct that local transport projects are and must be prioritised, and every region of our country will have more transport investment as a result of the decision that we made on HS2. Now, work is underway to consider potential upgrades to the West Coast Main Line, including improvements at Preston Station, which may support additional local services from South Files. I know the Rail Minister is carefully considering these options as we speak and will update my honourable friend in due course. Leila Moran. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thames Water are a shambles. In the recent flooding in Oxfordshire, they were dumping sewage from 270 sites along the Thames in one week. There was waste backing up into people's homes because of drains that they had not unblocked, and they couldn't even refill their own reservoir because the rivers were too dirty. But rather than offer a rebate for this shoddy service, they are intending to put bills up for everyone by 60 per cent. So will the Prime Minister explain to my constituents why they are being asked to foot the bill for Thames Water's gross incompetence? Yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, we have been clear that the volume of sewage discharged by water companies is unacceptable, and that is why we have launched the most ambitious storm overflow discharge reduction plan. And We have now achieved monitoring of almost every single storm overflow in England under this and previous governments, and have introduced unlimited penalties on water companies. And where there is evidence of poor performance, the Environment Agency will not hesitate to pursue water companies concerned, just as they did, I believe, a couple of years ago in the Honourable Ladies' constituency, where they fined Thames Water specifically £4 million following a serious incident. Theresa May. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Yesterday, the Honourable Member for Knowsley and I published our report on TIDE, Type 1 Diabetes and Disordered Eating, a condition estimated to affect over a quarter of Type 1 diabetics in the UK. It is life-shortening, life-threatening and can lead to death. I am pleased to say that Hampshire Integrated Care Board have already responded positively to the report. Will my right honourable friend ensure that the Government not only looks seriously at the recommendations we have put forward, but acts on those recommendations, which would improve lives, save lives, and save money for the NHS? Yeah. Can I start by thanking my right honourable friend and indeed the right honourable member for Knowsley 
for their important work on this issue. Of course, I know both of them speak from personal experience. And as she says, it is important that people get the treatment they need. The Health Secretary will, of course, consider the report. And the NHS has already been piloting services to support those with this condition, as she's aware of. And I understand that the NHS is also now expanding pilot sites to every region of the country so that even more people can benefit from the appropriate integrated care. And I'm okay. Mr Speaker, we entered 2024. The starvation and famine is acute as ever across the globe, much of it caused by the climate crisis. Yet at present, the world's worst hunger crisis is in Gaza, created by Israel's ongoing siege. The Integrated Food Security Phase Classification has found that of 600,000 people facing starvation globally, 95% of them are in Gaza. Yep. Mr Speaker, starvation used as a weapon of war is a war crime. Aye, aye. The Israeli government has the power to end the starvation crisis by ending the siege of Gaza and opening all crossings. Does it not, Prime Minister? Mr Speaker, I've uh, been absolutely clear that we are incredibly concerned about the devastating impact of the situation in Gaza on citizens. That's why we have tripled our humanitarian aid for this financial year to the region. And, as I said in the statement yesterday, are working with partners such as Jordan and the United States to open up new aid corridors so we can increase the supply of aid getting in to those who desperately need it. Miriam Kate. Thank, thank you, Mr Speaker. This morning, the press reported the tragic case of a 14-year-old girl who took her own life following horrific social media bullying, bullying including on TikTok and Snapchat. Since 2010, across the English-speaking world, there's been a marked increase in poor teen mental health, teen suicide attempts, and children addicted to pornography. The United Kingdom has a strong tradition of legislating to protect children from serious threats to their safety and welfare. So does my right honourable friend agree with me that it's time to consider banning social media and perhaps even smartphones for under-16s? Well, Mr Speaker, our... Mr Speaker, my honourable friend is absolutely right to highlight the impact of what happens online on our children, and that's why our Online Safety Act tackles both criminal activity online and protects children from harmful or inappropriate content, such as bullying or the promotion of self-harm, um, accessing pornography and also exposure to eating disorders. Ofcom are now rightly developing and consulting on the guidance and the codes of practices for how those platforms will meet their duties, and if they don't clean up their act, then Ofcom will be able to impose fines of up to 10% of global turnover on the social media firms. Mr Speaker, recently released documents reveal that the Foreign Office had serious concerns about the Israel's compliance with international humanitarian law and its ongoing assault uh, on Gaza. This assessment was hidden from Parliament. Whilst the Prime Minister boldly stated his confidence in Israel's respect for international law, since then, the scale of Israel's war crimes in Gaza have been revealed to the world thanks to South Africa's case to the ICJ. Therefore, is it now not the time for the Prime Minister to admit that he has the blood of thousands of innocent people on his hands and for him to commit to demanding an immediate ceasefire and an ending of UK's arms trade with Israel. Mr Speaker, that's the face of the changed Labour Party. in Port Cullis House yeah, yeah, and for yeah. your personal unwavering commitment to Holocaust course, remembrance. Yeah. Mr Speaker, as we approach Holocaust Memorial Day, <laughs> will the Prime Minister join me in commending the important work of the Holocaust Educational Trust, yeah. in particular their work with Holocaust survivors who, despite living through <laughs> the darkest moment in human history, continue to share their testimony in the hope of ensuring never again. Yeah. In the face of the appalling rise in anti-Semitism which we see on the streets of Britain, yeah. will my right honourable friend join me in encouraging all members to sign the Book of Commitment and stand up against anti-Semitism. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, I join my honourable friend in paying tribute to the brilliant work 
of the Holocaust Educational Trust and thank her for all her work on this issue. I'll be signing the Book of Commitment this afternoon during my meeting with Lily Ebert, and I encourage members on all sides to do the same and to reaffirm with shared determination to ensure that the Holocaust is never forgotten and to defeat the resurgence of anti-Semitism and all forms of hatred in our country. Final question, Sarah Champion. Mr Speaker, I represent a proud steel community in Rotherham who stand with the steel workers in Port Talbot at this very worrying time. My constituents don't want to see their taxpayers' money used to make British workers redundant, our primary steel making capacity decimated and our national security compromised. So will the Prime Minister change his destructive course, starting by looking at the credible multi-union plan to safeguard our steel industry's long-term future? Mr Speaker, I know this is an anxious time for steel workers in South Wales, but we are committed to working with the steel sector to secure a positive and sustainable future. Uh, The Honourable Lady will know that during the pandemic we provided support to CELSA, a steel company in South Wales, to safeguard jobs and ensure the sustainability of that plan. And what was proposed to happen in South Wales was the loss of 8,000 direct jobs, thousands more across the supply chain and the complete closure of the plant. Because of the government's investment and support and partnership with Tata, we have safeguarded 5,000 direct jobs, thousands more in the supply chain, and ensured the long-term sustainability of that steel plant so it has a brighter future. Obviously, this is difficult, but it's entirely churlish of her not to recognise the largest support package. It is one of the largest support packages that any government has provided any company and, in the process, safeguarded thousands of jobs. That completes Prime Minister's questions. Please let the Chamber clear.